All right, so we'll get started. Uh, welcome everyone. This is uh, BitDev LA. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to present to you Andy Edstrom. Uh, he works at Swan. He also has a background as a financial advisor. And um, he's going to present an orange pill everyone on um, the value of Bitcoin. Uh, but yeah, um, first, uh, shout out to our sponsors, River Financial and um, Casa, for um, helping us pay for this room and um, making all this happen. And so, um, yeah, with that being said, Andy, you can uh, go ahead and take it away. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, BitDevs LA. And thank you all for coming tonight. Um, yeah, I'm going to present my 10 year view on Bitcoin's potential value. And I'm going to take mostly a financial and monetary view because that's where I come from. Uh, I'm two decades in legacy finance, TradFi guy. Um, first half of that time was spent uh, investment banking at Goldman Sachs, working as an investor at a private equity fund that spun out of the Carlyle Group. And then I spent a number of years working at a multi-billion dollar hedge fund here in LA, which was bought by BlackRock, which is the world's biggest uh, investment firm. So that was the first half for me. And then second half was wealth management. As Andrew mentioned, I joined my family's firm, which is a wealth management and financial advisory firm. Thankfully, in 2017, I stumbled on Bitcoin after ignoring it twice before. Um, and then by 2019, I realized that uh, I needed to get the message out to friends, family, financial advisors. I knew they were missing the value proposition of Bitcoin. So I ended up writing a book called Why Buy Bitcoin, the audio version of which was uh, produced by our very own Damien Somerset, who did a fantastic job. Thank you, Damien. Um, so my talk today is basically going to be an excerpt. It's sort of going to be a subset of the ideas uh, presented in the book. So here we go. Oh, one more thing. I'm going to make it a little bit interactive. So I'm going to do a little bit of uh, peppering questions in now and then. Try to Try to keep it fun. <laughs> All right. So, first question, the man on the right, who is this? Yes, thank you. John Maynard Keynes, exactly. For sure, the most famous and influential economist of the 20th century. Uh, his ideas and theories basically dominated economics as practiced by governments, as we know, in the, in the prior century. Um, he had a lot of great ideas, a little bit like uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. And it turns out that when they collided with the reality of people, human nature, group dynamics, and what happens when uh, governments try to implement ideas uh, but have to deal with the actual practicalities of power, sometimes things can, uh, can go a little off the rails. And we'll get into that in a sec. My belief is that the man on the left, though, is whose ideas, economic ideas, are likely to dominate the 21st century. Anyone tell me who that is? Very good. Von Mises, probably the best known uh, member, at least the most uh, influential member of the Austrian school of economics. He focused more on uh, economics as uh, practiced by free markets and the individual trying to make his way in the economy. And I think and uh, hope that his ideas will be dominant in this century. And I'm going to get into why. So getting back to Keynes, the last century, in a word, Debt. Um, I'm not. We don't have time really to go through the whole uh, detailed history here. But suffice to say that I've got a few series on the chart here. On the right side y-axis is debt as a percent of GDP. I'm talking about total debt in the economy. So this is household debt, corporate debt, as well as government debt. Um, on the left so hand side, we have three other series: debt service, which is the combination of interest burden and amortization. When you go to pay your mortgage, for example, right, you're paying interest every month and you're amortizing the principal. And the two of those summed together provide debt service. Um, and what you can see over the last century was in the first few decades here, uh, post World War I, there were some wild times. We had the roaring 20s in the stock bubble. We had uh, smooth Hawley tariffs. FDR came to power to uh, deal with the Great Depression. But all through this period, there were fluctuations in debt and debt service. But basically, debt to GDP never jumped above roughly 200%. Now, post-war, of course, we ended up on the Bretton Woods standard, okay? 1944, Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. Who was there that we already talked about? John Maynard Keynes. 
he was probably the most influential economist that set up the monetary system that would run from 1944 to 1971. And throughout this period, debt to GDP and debt service overall were remarkably stable. Why? Because the money was tethered to gold. The dollar was tethered to gold and all or substantially all the Western uh, monies, Western countries' monies were tethered to the dollar. Now, of course, governments can't help themselves. We had uh, deficit spending in the U.S. Uh, not least was the Great Society policies as well as funding the Vietnam War. 1971 rolled around. At that point, European countries were delivering dollars to take gold because they knew the U.S. was printing too many uh, dollars against uh, that gold in a fractional reserve system. And so we went off the gold standard in 1971. Okay, what happened to debt as a percent of GDP? after 1971. Well, it went up like a rocket ship. Um, it peaked with the global financial crisis, 2008 to 2009, and then it actually tailed off uh, for a few years. But then we had another shock. What was that? Anyone? COVID. COVID. Thank you very much. And I've been too lazy to fully update this chart, <laughs> I'm sad to say. So we have our, our, uh, our big red arrow here where debt to GDP has approached roughly 400%. Now, as I mentioned before, this is household, corporate, and uh, government debt. But what am I leaving out? I'm talking about outstanding debt. I'm leaving out the entitlements, unfunded Social Security and Medicare. Those two components are roughly another 1,000% of GDP, right? So today, when you factor in the outstanding debt plus unfunded entitlements, we're living in a world of, call it, 1,400% debt to GDP, which is by far higher than it's ever been in the history of the U.S. And by the way, this picture looks roughly the same globally as it does in the U.S. So we got too much debt. Um, what are the potential solutions? Well, there's several options. They're all bad. <laughs> we can order from the a la carte menu of bad options, uh, and we can consider some of the combination platters. I'll start from the top and uh, move downward. So option one is austerity, right? What my grandma used to call living within your means. Um, that concept may have died with her generation, unfortunately. Uh, since then, governments, households, and companies have been spending more than they've been taking in in taxes, you know, revenue or income, respectively. And so balancing a budget, at least at the uh, household, I would argue at the corporate and at the government level, seems to be impossible. Unlikely we're going to get austerity. Okay, option two, mass defaults. That actually happened uh, in the late 20s, early 30s, right? In the Great Depression. And it was really ugly. The powers that be today, I'm talking about especially the Federal Reserve Board and the chair people, formerly Yellen, now uh, Jay Powell, they've studied this period and they didn't like what they saw. So they're unlikely to allow mass defaults baby, to, basically to clear out all the excess debt. Option three, Jubilee. This is a biblical concept. This is the notion that when a new leader comes to power, a king usually, they wipe the slate clean, right? They forgive all the debts. Well, in the modern era, this is a little bit problematic. Why? Because one man's debt or one man's liability is another man's asset. And so in the private market, if you have some ruler basically starting over that calls into question both property rights and contract law, which are the basis of our modern economy. So that's unlikely to happen. Although we're starting to see some debts that are owned by the government, for example, education debt, of which there's one and a half trillion in the world, or excuse me, in, in the US today, we're seeing, uh, let's say, murmurings of, of some of that debt being forgiven. But when you're talking about personal debt, corporate debt, or debt that the government owes other holders, Tough to just uh, to just cancel that debt. Okay, more likely we're going to order from the bottom of the menu. Redistribution, I'm talking about tax the rich, give to everybody else. Depending on which uh, administration is in power over the next decade, we're going to see this ebb and flow, but my expectation is we're going to see more of it overall. Financial repression, this is a term coined by a couple of Stanford economists in the 1970s. It includes keeping interest rates extremely low, Right? Anybody uh, earning any interest on their bank account yet? <laughs> By the way, they're they're raising interest rates. Right? Federal federal fund rate uh, is being uh, is being is being raised, but uh, I'm not holding my breath until I actually see some interest in my bank account. We'll see how it goes. Um, also, capital controls. We haven't seen a lot of this so far. 
We've seen a little bit more of it uh, with the recent war in Ukraine. Uh, we'll see how it goes. My expectation is we're going to see more uh, restrictions on movements of capital, uh, which fall under the financial repression heading. Okay. And then the magic bullet, item six, consumer price inflation. Um, we're already seeing that. Uh, that the, the reasons and the drivers for consumer price inflation, to be honest, have been in place for a few years, but uh, we're, we're really seeing it happen uh, as we look at the world today. All right, second fight. Now, now the quiz is getting harder. Uh, who's the guy on the left? Anybody? Yes. All right, Maui Country Club guy. Killing it. Killing it tonight. So Milton Friedman said, yes, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Anybody know who this is? Yeah. Steve Hankey, exactly. Who, by the way, is no friend to Bitcoin. Uh, but... He'll come around eventually. Um, Freeman always said that basically, if you print more money, you're more likely to end up with inflation. That's true as far as it goes. Hankey's insight is that empirically, the times when you see significant sustained periods of consumer price inflation tend to be when governments are on an ongoing basis running large deficits and the central bank is monetizing those deficits. And that's why he says it's a fiscal phenomenon. And that's basically where we are today. Okay, this is a slide that I put together two years ago for a talk at the Value of Bitcoin conference. And that was before, well, it was right after the coronavirus pandemic, which was actually at the moment in time, that moment in time two years ago, a disinflationary force. But we hadn't even seen, obviously, the war in, in Ukraine, massively inflationary. So... I just want to talk a little bit about inflation. The first thing I'll admit is nobody really understands inflation. Okay, fact one. Um, fact two, uh, my suspicion about why that is, is because there's a social psychological component, right? Um, when you live through, let's say, four decades of relatively low inflation, that's been my personal experience, I don't know about you in the crowd, um, you kind of get used to the notion that, yeah, my, my money is bleeding away value over time, but it's not too terrible. But then when you get shocks, there can be some tipping point, right? Where people start to look around and they see, oh, you know, even the official CPI is whatever, eight and a half percent, let's say. Oh, and by the way, the things I'm, I'm buying seem to be going up faster than that in price in the last year. And then people look around and they start talking and then they start wanting to hold less of the money. Uh, so the velocity goes up, you know, the demand basically to hold money goes down and you can end up with a self-reinforcing feedback loop which causes people to want less money, which causes prices to go up relatively more. Okay, so I'll just talk about a few factors here um, that I think explain perhaps, or at least in part, what's going on with inflation recently. So first is technology. Okay, green arrow pointing down is disinflationary. Um, technology is basically always and everywhere deflationary, right? We learn how to do things better, faster, cheaper with less resources. Um, that may actually be accelerating, which is my belief is that, you know, in the last couple decades, it was a dis disinflationary force. It may be even more disinflationary in the future. Jeff Booth, uh, Price of Tomorrow, a book I highly recommend, lays out the case for that. But all these other factors, in my opinion, are inflationary and especially recently. So globalization and trade, probably by now everyone knows, China joined the WTO right in 2001. So we had this period of globalization ended about a decade ago. Then when Trump was elected, especially, we started to decouple. We had the tariffs. And then, of course, we had uh, the recent uh, war in Ukraine, which is even further disrupting supply chains. So that's an inflationary force because trade is efficient. It brings down cost. It brings, down labor, or brings in labor from all over the world to keep the cost of production low. Now that's going in reverse. Demographics is a major factor, too. So we had a couple of things going on. The largest cohort or the largest generation in U.S. history is actually the millennial generation. And they joined the workforce uh, for a period ending a few years ago. In other words, basically all the millennials got jobs, or at least the ones that were going to. And so that was supply coming into the labor force that stopped coming. Now we got the boomers at the other end of the demographic spectrum. They're retiring. So they're taking their labor out of the system which means you've got a lot less labor in the, in the system overall in net, and that's inflationary. 
And then, of course, you got government stimulus. And I'm just not even really going to talk about the fact that <laughs> basically we've been running deficits and they keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And yeah, they ebb and flow over time. But suffice to say, in net, uh, bigger and bigger deficits. All these factors are inflationary. All right. So what? So what if you live in an inflationary time? I think we live in an inflationary time right now. I think the next decade is likely to be inflationary. The last period of major inflation was the 1970s. What was the one asset that you had to own in the 1970s? Anyone? Gold. Yes, gold. Gold went from $35 an ounce to roughly $700 an ounce, okay? 20x, more than 30% annualized return in about a decade. Uh, bonds got wrecked. Stocks did poorly. Real estate did relatively well. The problem with real estate today as an investment is the prices are incredibly high, right? Whether you're talking about a multiple of rents generated on rental properties or commercial properties, or you're talking about a multiple of household income for houses, the valuations on real estate are much higher than they were back in the 1970s. Um, so that's unlikely, in my opinion, to be as good a hedge. Okay, so gold was the thing to own. What about today? Well, why own gold? Um, gold is the classic monetary asset. By the way, here's another quiz for you. Who took uh, Econ 101? All right, and what, what were the three things that your econ teacher or your textbook told you make something money? Anyone? Store value, medium of exchange, and uh, unit of account. Yes, nailed it. Okay, store value, medium of exchange, unit of account. That's what I was taught about money. Um, what I wasn't taught about money was what makes something a good store of value, medium of exchange, unit of account. And so it wasn't until I encountered Bitcoin that I figured out what those underlying characteristics of money are. Um, and that led me to why I think looking forward, Bitcoin is actually going to be a better hard money asset to be invested in than gold. Okay. When you ask most people, what are the characteristics make something good money? Usually you get five or six, maybe seven characteristics. Now, I'm not saying this is the definitive list, but unfortunately, uh, I'm pretty sure that the list is at least this long because I'm confident that every one of these characteristics is important to something being considered good money. Um, so it may not be exhaustive, uh, but at least there are 14. Um, I have, for purposes of this exercise, equal weighted them, which is certainly wrong because some of these characteristics are more important than others. Some of them are more important to certain people at certain times, such as most of the time, you probably don't need a money that's censorship resistant that someone you know, can't stop you paying someone with, except for when you really need it, right? In certain circumstances. But for purposes of analysis, what I've done here is I've scored the dollar, gold, and Bitcoin on these 14 characteristics. And I'm sorry, the, uh, the font's a little small, but these are stacked bar charts for the 14 characteristics, and I've scored them one to five, which is sort of arbitrary. You know, there's a, there's a lot of sort of qualitative analysis here, but uh, it's the best I can do. And there's a few key conclusions here. So the first is that Bitcoin overall already slightly outscores gold. That's interesting. The second thing to consider is gold hasn't really changed for centuries or maybe even millennia, but Bitcoin is improving. And so when I think about Bitcoin today, I think it already outscores gold overall in the 14 characteristics. But I think in the future, thanks in part to the efforts of some people in this room, uh, is likely to score even higher because people are building tools that make Bitcoin more useful as money, more transferable, right? more liquid, um, numerous parameters along which Bitcoin is improving over time, whereas gold is static. So, why buy Bitcoin? Um, for me, Bitcoin is an investment today in an asset that's developing into the world's hardest money. It's developing into something that is even better than gold. And my view is that in this decade, which I expect to be inflationary, if it would have been key to own gold prior to the existence of Bitcoin, I think it's key to own Bitcoin today. So what's the total addressable market of Bitcoin? I think it's at least tens of trillions of dollars, possibly hundreds of trillions. 
but I'm going to take the more conservative view and say it's at least <laughs> it's at least tens of trillions, right? And today, Bitcoin overall as a network is worth less than a trillion dollars. Okay, so what's the upside here? I see at least six categories. Um, the first is digital gold, right? We looked at the scoring on the prior page: gold versus Bitcoin. Bitcoin is improving. Gold is static. Bitcoin already outscores outscores gold. Um, Today, gold is a 10 or $11 trillion asset overall. You might say that a little over half of it is, is the monetary value of it. So I think uh, Bitcoin can easily take half of gold's market share over the next decade. That'd be about $3 trillion. That'd be about $3 trillion, by the way, assuming that gold stays at $11 trillion. I'm actually kind of bullish on gold. I think gold takes a share from other assets, and I think Bitcoin in turn takes share from gold. Offshore assets. Um, nobody knows how big the offshore asset market is. Uh, I think it's the UN uh, estimates it between 10 and 30 trillion. So I use the conservative end. The lower end is 10 trillion. I think easily Bitcoin takes 20% of the offshore asset market. It's not hard to see why. Many wealthy people own assets in different jurisdictions than the ones they live in for obvious reasons. Bitcoin is in the jurisdiction known as cyberspace. Oh, and by the way, if you can remember 12 words, right, you can cross a border with essentially any amount of Bitcoin. Convince me, please, that uh, wealthy people and not so wealthy people aren't going to want to own some Bitcoin just for that reason. Okay, fiat. Today, you know, $10 trillion worth of fiat money, dollars, euros, yen, et cetera, in the world. I think Bitcoin, if it reaches potential, reaches its potential, we'll take uh, maybe 20% share there. Bonds are a really interesting opportunity, right? $100 trillion worth of bonds in the world today, which have a negative real yield. Yes, you know the 30-year treasury is, I don't know, up to 3% or something, but if inflation's at 8%, uh, you're still losing purchasing power. So I think that some portion of the bond market actually probably flows to gold and then in turn flows to Bitcoin simultaneously. Other stores of value, um, $400 trillion roughly worth of real estate, stocks and collectibles. Um, if you're an investor, would you rather buy a second or third home in a different jurisdiction? Or would you rather own some Bitcoin, which is far more liquid, truly limited supply, harder to tax, right? Because you can't see it. Very easy to tax real estate, which is right there. Um, I think a lot of people are gonna are gonna allocate some from uh, real estate, stocks, and other collectibles to to Bitcoin. And then the last category is you know brand new use cases we haven't even thought of. Um, as with any new disruptive technology, there's going to be new use cases that show up. Um, I can't even anticipate what they'll be. Someone smarter than me in this room will, is working on them uh, right now, no doubt, and uh, there'll be some value there. But I assign zero just to be conservative. So the grand total, I get to 24 trillion within a decade. That's $1.2 million per Bitcoin, which is roughly 30x the current price. Question? Um, is that at today's current purchasing power or is that like... Yes. Yeah. Yes, I, exactly. I'm not talking about uh, debased shroot bucks, <laughs> right? I'm talking about like, yes, purchasing power comparable to today's dollars. Yeah, that's my, uh, that's my expectation. So, all right. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, check out my book, Why Buy Bitcoin. Um, I'll, I'll add also, you know, personally, I'm, uh, one of the things that came out of my uh, exploration with Bitcoin was I realized that financial advisors were, uh, were missing it. So I'm working with Swan Bitcoin to launch a service for financial advisors to get their clients into Bitcoin. So, um, so if you want to learn more about that information there, and uh, I think that's all I got. Yeah, of course. Of course. Questions? Um, so, in the, the, the menu of options that the government have, um, I don't know if maybe this is already like included in one of them, but uh, I continuously see on Twitter uh, people talk about uh, governments trying to kind of uh, smooth the situation by doing something called a uh, yield, yield curve uh, control. control. Yeah. What's that? All right. 
<laughs> Great question from Gaston. Pre uh, previous uh, BitDevs LA speaker, by the way, check out his uh, check out his uh, his presentation. It's on the website, right? All right. Uh, what is yield curve control? So yield curve. First of all, a yield curve is different maturities. So like say three months, one year, five year, ten years, and it's the bonds for the fixed income instrument with that maturity, and it's the yield of that instrument. So let's say that the yield curve is flat. That means that the three-year treasury yields 2% and the five-year yields 2% and the 10-year yields 2%, et cetera, et cetera. Usually, the yield curve is upward sloping. For obvious reasons, if you're going to lend a government money for a longer period of time, you expect a higher yield than if you're going to lend them money short term. Okay, so yield curve control is the central bank saying, we are going to pin the yield at some specific level. They do this in Japan. They say, look, we want bonds to yield 0% and we will transact in the market, right? Buy and sell as necessary. By the way, it's usually buy, not sell, <laughs> to pin the yield at 0%, right? If somebody wants to sell a bond because they think it should yield 1%, the central bank says, no problem, we'll buy it. That's what's happened in Japan. Japan, the Japanese uh, government or the central bank specifically, I think now owns a majority of all the government bonds. So you can have yield curve control at, at any point of maturity um, you know, on the yield curve, but potentially it can be literally the, the, the Fed, for example, could say, we are going to pin yields at, pick a number, 2% for all maturities. This is different than quantitative easing, QE. With QE, they instead say, oh, we're going to buy bonds at a certain amount per time, right? We're going to buy $100 billion a month of treasuries, and we're going to buy $50 billion a month of mortgage bonds. But they are uh, stuck with whatever the yield that comes out of the market as a result of those purchases is. Whereas yield curve control says, we're going to buy as many as it takes. We're going to print as many, uh, as many dollars or yen or euros to pin the yield at whatever we choose. In the case of Japan, 0%. So we haven't seen that uh, explicitly in Europe or the U.S. Could we end up there? It's possible. Um, it's very possible. I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> yeah, because and, 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 and doing these, uh, I guess, in all these very inflationary. Sure. Right. It should be. It should be inflationary compared to. The alternative. So if the alternative is, is yeah, we're just going to buy a certain amount of bonds and print, and therefore print the dollars to do it each month. Um, the implication is that you may have to create more dollars to pin yields at whatever level you choose, because you may have to print an unlimited amount to do whatever it takes to buy enough bonds to to pin the yield at whatever one percent, two percent, zero percent. Yeah, yeah, could be very inflationary. Would they be doing that to avoid an inverted yield curve? Is that what? Um, I mean, because that's a typical sign of a recession. Yeah, yeah. I would say that in that's right. Number one, you're right. It's a sign of recession. Number two, we you know we inverted between the two year and the ten year recently. Although it's since reversed itself, it's now upper, the curve is upward sloping again. I think you would say that if you're in an inverted situation. That's actually not great candidate for yield curve control, at least for, for longer maturities, because already the market is bidding up the price of the longer bond and therefore bidding down the yield, right? Because the yield of the long bond is lower than the short, than the short bond. So I would say that, uh, yeah, I would say the inversion, if it endures, is, uh, is indicative of the market thinking that short term rates are going to have to come down, perhaps because there'll be a recession and the bank has to stimulate. I don't know if it's a signal of yield curve control. That's a good question. I'd have to think about it. Any any Japanese central bankers in the room that can uh, can explain it to us? I was gonna say, when you think about the Fed rate rate, it seems like the market has priced like seven or eight price hikes like by the end of the twenty like this year. Yeah. So what are the like the odds you give them that they get through all of them or? Yeah, I don't. I mean, the short answer is I don't know. I think that I mean the market. If you look at 
So there is a market for federal funds rate futures, right? So you can actually place a bet. You can do it with leverage. And if you're right, if you're more right than the market, you'll make money. Um, so generally speaking, I mostly uh, believe the market with the caveat that if financial markets, especially stocks, really dump hard, that'll force the, that'll force the Fed right, to reverse course. And I'm not convinced that you know, a bear market like 20% down in the S&P would be sufficient. I think to get the Fed to reverse course, more likely you'd have to have the bond market uh, vomiting. And what I mean by that is almost exactly two years ago, right, as COVID uh, was hitting investors in the head like a ton of bricks, stocks went down, gold went down, and then after some period of, of time, treasuries went down. So the bonds, the, the, uh, the treasury bonds, which are supposed to be the safe haven asset, right, started falling in price. That was the panic moment for the Fed. Uh, when they realized that uh, financial markets were really falling apart. I sort of think that if we had that level of dysfunction in financial markets, that could reverse the Fed's course and cause them to stop raising rates. I'm not sure that they're going to do it absent you know, that kind of a shock, which is entirely possible, by the way. <laughs> like, wouldn't surprise me at all if we had a bear market, a real bear market in stocks, and then after some period of time, the bond market falls out of bed, and then the Fed says, okay, now we got a reverse course. But in the bond market, all first, I thought credit is like Yeah, so uh, I guess it's I guess you could say it's a matter of degree. Certainly, when rates, well, there's a couple pieces. There's risk credit, so like there's the junk bond market, high yield credit. That tends to be a good indicator or a leading indicator of where stocks could go. So if spreads blow out and uh, junk bonds trade down, that's a bad sign for for stocks. When you're talking about uh, treasuries, yeah, I mean, it depends. So historically, when rates and therefore treasury yields move up for some period of time in a rate hike cycle, usually stocks do fine. And then after rates go too far, then you tend to have problems in the stock market. And then related to that is also the magnitude of, of yields as well as inflation. Um, three to 4% inflation is great for stocks. 4% and up tends to be bad. Uh, currently, we're experiencing you know 8.5% on the one-year consumer price inflation uh, index. That'll probably come down. We'll see. But it may not come down enough for the stock market to, you know, to kind of sail through it. So... It's a lot of factors. Who knows what the future holds? But uh, that's my comment on credit. We got time for more? Not too much. Uh, you said you were somewhat bullish on gold. Uh, seems to me gold should be sort of leading the charge right now in the county in the current environment. I've heard some of these um, people out there say that maybe one of the reasons for that is that someone manipulated a lot of paper and a lot of instruments out there, financial instruments, and, and sort of the crap flat world that would be suppressing the price of gold. Do you think that is true or contributes to it? And secondly, probably more germane to this discussion, do you think we need to worry about that in terms of Bitcoin with all these things coming up and talking about spot ETF and FX markets and yep. crap flat Bitcoin? Great question. Okay, so a few thoughts there. So first of all, I believe that Bitcoin is taking market share from gold already. I can say that on behalf of myself <laughs> because I manage, uh, you know, I personally manage roughly 300 million of client assets and I have an asset allocation, which I call hard money assets. In the seventies, that would have been gold and monetary metals. Today, it's like half Bitcoin and half gold and monetary metals. So already for me, Bitcoin is taking share from gold and I think the same can be said from some other investors out there in the market. Not all, but some. Um, yeah, would I have expected gold to outperform, to do better than it has in the last you know, year or two? Yes. Um, hasn't been terrible. I think gold is up double digits year to date. Um, you know, I started buying it for clients in 2016. 
it, it, I think in the three year, if you look at the three year, I heard this reported somewhere, the three year return on the S&P and gold are approximately equal as of recently, surprisingly. Uh, and so, yeah, I don't know. Could gold be doing better? Sure. But uh, I think it's doing okay. And I do think Bitcoin is taking share. To your point about paper claims on gold and the futures market, I do think that an overdeveloped futures market can be suppressive to the price of any commodity, which is true of gold, it's true of silver, you know, anything else. Um, it does worry me if the futures market for Bitcoin becomes totally overblown. You know, basically hypertrophies, you know, becomes much larger relative to the spot market. I haven't seen that yet. And I think it's like a little less likely that it happens because one of the beauties of Bitcoin, as you know, is that you can demand delivery relatively costlessly in a way that's not true for any physical commodity. And I think that puts a check basically on uh, shenanigans, let's say, that can go on with price manipulation in physical commodity markets. Um, I feel like you had a third, uh, third question there. I don't know if I, I don't know if I hit it. That's, that's, that's my view. So yeah, it's a concern for me, but unless and until I see the futures markets in Bitcoin become way overgrown relative to the spot, to the spot market, I'm not too concerned about it. And in, and in the meantime, I used to think that volatility in Bitcoin price was a bug, but I've come to view it as a feature because as a result of the short-term volatility of Bitcoin price, right? One of the 14 characteristics of money, Bitcoin isn't money, quote unquote, wink, wink. <laughs> in other words, the central bankers and the powers of being government look at it and they say, oh, there's no way that something with such a volatile dollar price could ever be money. But of course, year after year, the volatility in dollar price terms of Bitcoin comes down. I think that if Bitcoin reaches its potential, which it has a good chance of doing, the volatility in terms of either dollar price or purchasing power is likely to, to reduce with time. And in the meantime, uh, you know, smart devs like uh, Steve back there and uh, other folks in this room can keep building on Bitcoin making it stronger, getting it into more people's wallets and portfolios. And by the time government's actually considering money, it'll be too late because everybody will own it. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, listening and participating. Really appreciate it.